Hello and welcome to a couple of very special tapes on the subject I call creation. I need to probably define a few terms here before we get going and explain a little bit more about what I'm talking about. Here on Earth we look up at the stars and peer out in the sky and so forth and wonder where we may have come from, how we got here, uh, is there any meaning to our life. We search through uh, different belief structures, religions, philosophies and so forth, trying to answer the big questions in our life because we really have no factual knowledge exactly where we came from and what's going on in the universe. So far, technically, we've been unable to get off our planet. We don't have the technology to fly out into the cosmos, nor do we have the science yet to understand how the universe may have come about. And if there is any logic to the universe, what exactly is it? You see, it's the logic of what the universe is actually doing is where the explanation of the planets and the life forms actually come from. It is the task, you might say, of our modern day religions and belief structures to try to explain what the universe is doing, to try to explain the meaning of our lives. Scientists are also doing this. Every day they're working on unraveling the mysteries of the universe. They're trying to figure out how it started, how it's evolving, what it's actually doing. They're trying to provide answers to our questions about ourselves. So actually, religious leaders and scientists really aren't too far apart. They're really searching for answers to the same questions, uh, just from slightly different perspectives. Scientists are trying to, you might say the nuts and bolts guys, are trying to actually logically explain what the universe is doing and how our lives may fit into it, where religious leaders are more or less philosophical speaking trying to explain it or theologically speaking, trying to explain it. They're not concerned with the actual nuts and bolts. They're speaking from more of a spiritual standpoint. Well, unfortunately, neither our scientists nor our religious leaders have been well-schooled, you might say, in the matrix of the universe, how it started, what a universe is. Is there really logic in the universe that controls our lives? Well, among the great Pleiadian information that Billy Meyer has been able to... Um, receive and understand there's quite a bit of information on that and it actually it came in little pieces all throughout all of his contact notes and if you've gone through all of those tapes you will notice that uh, so far I really haven't spent too much time trying to explain uh, much about creation philosophy theology these things because it was in different sections through all out the notes so I tried to put it together all into two cohesive tapes so not only can I explain it a little bit better, but hopefully my explanation then will be a little clearer and you'll have a better chance of understanding it than if I gave it to you in little pieces. Because I found out that throughout the entire context, they really answered most all the big questions. Uh, on these two tapes you're about to listen to now, I'm going to explain a lot about what the Pleiadians have uh, provided Billy with, the answers to the big questions. What is the universe? How did it start? Uh, why is there a universe? Why are there life forms? And what is the meaning to our lives? And is there something beyond our physical lives? So that's the things we're going to talk about on these two tapes. So I almost warn you right now, uh, whatever uh, preconceived notions you may have, which are fine, uh, about what you think life is and how it may have come about, you're probably going to be opened up to some new ideas on these two tapes there. I know I certainly was when I first heard all of this information. It made a lot of sense to me, and personally, I believe in all the concepts that the Pleiadians are stating here. It all makes very much sense to me. Quite a bit of it, most of it, seems very familiar, which is probably what uh, drew me to a lot of this information to begin with. So anyway, for our, the sake of our discussion here, uh, a creation is slightly different than what a universe is. And that will be explained as I tell you how a universe actually comes about. So let's uh, back up to the very beginning and start there. You see, once we have the science and technology on our own society to actually leave the planet and go out and study the universe, we'll start answering a lot of questions. And as our science gets more developed, our technologies get better, we'll probably be able to actually move in time, move backward and forward, and watch cause and effect. Actually watch the universe unfold and see things happening. We also will come in contact with other races far more developed than ourselves. I'm sure there are many races out there, like the Pleiadians, and many that we've never even heard anything about yet, which are far more advanced than we are, and already benefit from a greater time, space, and a far greater intelligence. So we have a lot to learn. 
Leaving our planet is like the first day of school for us as a race. So the things we're going to talk about here is a, probably a pretty good primer for our first day in school. My point is simply this, that the Pleiadians, as well as many other races, races who've already been out there, their technology has allowed them to study the universe and actually understand what's going on. In the case of the Pleiadians, it's even gone so far as to come in contact with other races far more developed than themselves, who are on the very throes of perfection of the life form and have far more extensive understandings of the concept of a universe and the meaning of life than they do. So they're far more well-schooled than we are. The information on these tapes is the current Pleiadian philosophy of life and understanding of the universe. You see, the universe itself, the universe that we live in, we have no known uh, parameters, you might say, or knowledge of its size and what it's actually doing. We believe the universe is expanding currently. That's the current theory for our scientists. And according to the Pleiadians, they are right. It is expanding. It will contract later on. Okay, let's start at the very beginning and explain exactly what a universe is and what a creation is. You see, our universe is not alone. There are many universes. As a matter of fact, the universe that we are living in is inside of a much larger universe where it is estimated by the Pleiadian technology that there are 10 to the 49th power number of universes in this very large universe. 10 to the 49th power means if you took a pencil and sat down and made a 1 and then put 49 zeros out, that's the size of the number. Now that's a huge number. That's how many universes there are in this very large universe. And since there is no particular name for it, Billy has it marked down in his notes that the Pleiadians call it an absolutum. And that means that they have no knowledge beyond that. They have been able to move into uh, some other universes and have gained some understanding of what the absolutum may do, but their, limit, their knowledge is also very limited in that area. But they have got far enough to find out that our universe, along with 10, with 49, 0, number of other universes, exist in a much larger universe. And this very large universe, this absolutum, actually is doing something. It's evolving also. It's creating universes. And they have figured out that there are three stages to a universe. Okay, here's what happens. In the beginning, in this large absolutum that has 10 with 49 number of zeros of universes in it, excuse me, when it goes to create a new universe, it has an idea to do that. The idea to create the new universe is called the creation. The creation is an idea. It is an idea embodied into itself with knowledge and understanding. So the absolutum, it is a living life form which has knowledge and understanding because it's already created many, many universes before us, so it knows how to create one. It has an idea to create another one. This idea, this little ball of energy that is embodied with the idea to create another universe is called a creation. And so it does just that. And when it does it, this idea, and remember we talked earlier about all energy, the universe is either energy in a fine matter state or a coarse matter state. This creation is in what's called a fine matter state. Now again, if we have energy such as electricity, things that are unseen, any types of energy, those are considered fine matter. If you have something in solid form, that's considered coarse matter. So a spiritual thought or a creational energy source is a fine matter, whereby a planet, an animal, or a person is a coarse matter, okay? Because uh, we're going to relate to these terms all the way through many of these explanations. So the creation itself is a fine matter energy. It's very small. It's just a thought. It's a very small, like a flea, a little small piece of energy. But it has something unique. Because it's an idea from the absolutum, it already benefits from the knowledge of the Absolutum, which has created other universes before. So it also it's already very, very powerful as an energy source. The energy that is within this little small creation is actually moving in a very intricate, your exotic spiral formation. And in your exhibit, there's a drawing, uh, as best as possible, a little bit about how that energy moves, the formation of that spiral. So it is in there. The idea to create a new universe is a creation and the energy within it is moving in this egg form spiral shape and it's very small 
The spiral is the original spiritual form, then, that will create our universe. The energy that's inside of this small spiral is now rotating. It rotates and it pulsates. Okay? What happens is, over a period of time, this idea, this creation, that has the idea to create a universe, slowly evolves. It works out uh, how and where it's going to do it by benefit of the knowledge it's received from the Absolutum. At a certain point, then, this creation, then, uh, establishes the area where the universe is going to be. Now, picture in your mind, if you will, and there is a drawing in your exhibit called the Absolutum, which was just a quick idea to show you that there's a large universe uh, called an Absolutum with a whole bunch of other universes in it. And what happens is, when our universe then, uh, the creation decides to create a new universe, the area is established where our universe will be. And that's something similar to what the Big, uh, big Bang Theory is. There is something like an explosion, they say, but there's no material or coarse matter that explodes. It's only fine matter. It's only energy. So the energy itself expands and creates an area in the absolutum where the universe then is going to grow and evolve. The creation is doing this. And the creation, again, is just fine matter energy with the knowledge from the absolutum. It has now created an area where the universe, where you and I live, is going to grow. However, there are no material things in it right now. It is a large size, but there's nothing in there but fine matter, just energy. There are no planets at this point, and there's no time involved. It's just energy that rotates in a spiral fashion. Now, the energy continues on now to learn and understand, and the creation gets the thoughts and ideas, understanding, and the sense of reason, and it comes up with the idea of life. Idea is the key word here because as we're learning in science, all matter possibly was formed from an idea. Ideas, just like when you think, are formed by logical conclusion. And as the idea becomes more concentrated upon, it becomes to get stronger in energetic form. It can actually create solid material things. So and this is how our universe has come about. The creation has created the universe and all of this material by the knowledge that was embodied within it. And now we have the giant area. Our universe is growing. There are no planets in it yet, but it has thought, feeling, understanding, sense of reason, and an idea to create life. It then creates what's called space and time. In other words, the matrix then of our universe begins to become created. And we have a big empty universe with movement because now we have the space, the emptiness, and it creates time. And it does this by virtue of an impulse it gets from the absolutum. Our universe now continues to grow. And as it does so, belts or divisions begin to occur within this large area. Okay? What has happened now, our universe is glowing like a large, the word is so hard, because this big energy form in the middle of our universe, which becomes like a central sun, it's called by them a Sohar. And what it is, it is a concentrated form of the knowledge of creation embedded into our universe. All of this knowledge that is growing on how to evolve the universe is in this central sun area. That is called the Sohar. It's like a bright light. And as our universe then <coughs> continues to grow and expand, it will form belts looking similar to like a tree trunk. And if you look at the exhibit there, you'll see that there are a certain number of belts, uh, seven of them all together, and uh, is how our universe then separates. As time goes by and creation continues to uh, use its knowledge and so forth and understanding to create this universe, slowly those belts start manifesting at different levels of evolution. And the third belt in is called the material belt, as you can see on the diagram. The outer belt is called the push belt, which separates it from the other universes. But the third belt in is where all of the planets, the coarse matter, is evolving. It's similar to like what an egg does. It has different layers in it. Only our universe is divided into seven layers. It is establishing already that there are seven levels seven different types of energy in our energy has different understanding, different knowledge, and different purpose. So the logic of the universe is beginning to be established by virtue of this creational idea, this embodied idea that is creating all of this material. Okay? So 
This continues on to a point where there is a material belt. And in this material belt, unlike any of the other belts, in here now, the energy matter, the fine matter, begins to get thicker and thicker, denser or denser. If you can imagine uh, nothing and then energy, and then what would energy be as it gets a little bit denser? Well, there was no word for it uh, in the German language, so uh, Billy decided to call it fluffy matter. So before it becomes gas, it's what's called fluffy matter. First, there is the thought of the creation. The thought gets thicker, more dense, and more dense, and turns into fluffy matter. And eventually, the fluffy matter then evolves into gaseous states, which are going to form all of our suns and planets through nebulae. Okay? At this particular point, something very important happens, though, in our universe. Once our universe has established a material belt, then time begins. Up until that point, there is no time in the universe because time only acts upon material objects, coarse matter objects, all right? Uh, and this time impulse somehow comes into our universe then by via the creation from some source of the universe that created us. One universe creates another. There are cycles to universes. So our universe has now evolved to the point where it has a material belt, and time is beginning. When time starts, time is an energy force that moves like waves. It's divided into small units of impulses which speed through the universe in waves. This causes the rotation and animation of the matter. Moving time is now born, and the motion of creation is now started. Creation is creating... Uh, a universe, we call it, with seven different layers, seven different, uh, they're calling it belts, seven different stages of evolutionary material, each stage having its own function, the fifth stage now having the function of creating material or coarse matter form that we come along. And the reason I draw this point out again is that pay attention to the logic of what the creation is doing to make the universe because these same principles that are being set in motion pertain to our life. Okay, which we're going to get into a little bit later. Okay, so the idea of creation then is continued uh, by the eternity of what's called the Ur from the original creation or this absolutum. Spiritual energies are now moving, they're rotating, fluffy matters turning into gas. Gases then form, condense over billions and billions of years. And what happens, of course, is, is what we're aware of now, that these gases then in these large areas of our universe called nebula, uh, we form into suns, planets are formed and cool down, and they form into solar systems. Uh, nothing unusual about this. We're all aware from school the slow evolution of what our universe actually does. At this particular time in our development, though, uh, we still have this fluffy matter, and I just want to point out at that stage of development there, though, which time has started, time then causes all of this fluffy matter then to start moving. These waves or impulses of time that move through the fluffy matter is how the galaxies and the motion of the universe actually gets started. Because time creates movement, it creates rotation, it creates rotation and pulsation of the fluffy matter. And so that's the reason, and by the way, these waves of impulses move in the spiral form uh, that's in your exhibit there, in that particular shape. That's why there's no edge to the universe, because the energies all move in this spiral fashion, and they never really come to an end of anything. They're like a continuous uh, movement that keeps moving on. Time, the clock as we think of it, then started way back when. Billions of years ago then, even trillions of years ago, uh, when this impulse of time came into our material belt, that's when the clock started ticking. So from that point on, the impulses of time are animating the matter, and the time machine started. And the concept, technology, whatever, of moving in time is the understanding of how these pulses work in the coarse matter world. Time travel then can be reduced simply to the understanding of the impulses of the time factor, where you can actually move up and down these pulses and see matter at different stages of development, which is time traveling. Okay? At this point, though, we have no firmament. There's no stars floating around. That's what happens next. The fluffy matter then rotates, pulsates us into spirals, uh, which resemble the egg shape of the original form of this spiral. And that continues on. 
Uh, at that point, though, it's a dark universe because we don't have anything except the central sun, but the universe itself is dark. So if we were to see it at that point, it'd just be black, unless we were close enough just to see the central part. The fluffy matter then evolves into galaxies and begins to show very brightly, causing the darkness of space to be broken. Also, it starts warming it up because as all of this fluffy matter evolves into gas, the gas becomes more and more condensed and starts creating all of these suns. The suns start putting off great amount of energy. We have electrical magnetic radiation then moving through the universe, starting to affect other coarse matter. This is the beginning then of where astrology would start. And uh, we have heat now. <laughs> Up till this point, it's probably been pretty cold in the emptiness of space. But logic is being set in pattern here because every step of the way, all of the fine matter and the coarse matter of the universe have attained their level that they are at through reasoning and understanding. And this is forming the logic exactly of what the universe is and is laying down, if you will, the laws or the commandments or whatever you want to call them of what existence is all about. You see, man doesn't come along and establish the rules of the universe. We don't make the laws of creation. The laws, if you want to call them that, are nothing more than the logic of how the universe is working, how the universe came about. And this is how it came about. So it's setting in pattern this numbering of seven, seven layers, seven layers of development. And the logic then of what life and how life will evolve is being established at these very times as the universe is being created from the idea of the creation. Okay, the evolution will continue, and of course, as the suns begin to evolve and come into being, so do the planets who cool down, their matter will cool down, they fall into formation around the suns, and I'm not going to elaborate here on astronomy and those things, because that's not the purpose here. I'm much more interested in just the development of the fine matter or spiritual world, and an explanation of how our lives fit into the logic of the universe. So, as we would move through, then trillions of years of time, the universe itself is going to evolve, the planets will solidify, cool down, becomes, excuse me, become solid. And then, of course, what happens next uh, is the evolution of flora, which is air, water, and the plants, and so forth, and all the million different forms within nature begin to evolve. Important to note, though, that all throughout nature, as all of this uh, food kingdom, if you want to call it that, starts to be evolved over trillions and, excuse me, billions of years that that will take, the logic of the universe is being used here in every step of the way. Every time a plant is evolving and being created, it is being done so with the logic that was provided originally by the creation, that embodied idea that is still the original map or idea that's causing everything to work. My point simply is, is to keep clear all throughout that there is definite logic and understanding to what the universe is doing, and that it is following exactly, as the Pleiadians are telling us, these levels of seven stages of development all of the way through, and this also, man will mimic and follow this same, same uh, level of evo same stages of development that the universe is doing. After the food kingdom, uh, of course, has evolved, since the universe is not totally stupid, you have to have food before you can have animals who eat food. So once that uh, the universe understands uh, through the knowledge of creation, exactly, at this point you can start seeing where a creation and a universe are really the same thing. A creation, uh, what Pleiadians call the original idea to create a universe, actually is, but all throughout this creation, then, uh, basically is the fine matter energy which creates a universe. Okay, So creation and universe start to become kind of synonymous here as this thing, and, and for the rest of the explanation it really will become the same thing because creation is an idea that grows into being a universe. At this point now, the logic of creation has understood how to make the food kingdom. It has the idea of life, and it has learned that first it must create food so that there can be creatures to eat it. Fauna, uh, which is the animal kingdom, comes along. And, of course, the animal kingdom now is an entirely different level of spiritual energy. It is a different level. It's following the seven levels of development that are established uh, within the matrix of the universe or creation itself. 
And each one of those seven levels is broken down to seven other levels with seven subgroupings under that. So in the Pleiadian science, they've been able to map out entirely all these different levels of development of the creation itself. And through time travel and knowledge from other races, they've learned to understand each incremental step that a creation goes through in its evolution. Because this original idea of creation is doing exactly that. It is an idea that is evolving. Probably not so much different than just an idea that each one of you may have at any given moment. That idea is set in motion. It does not just die out. All of your thoughts and ideas have life to them. And when concentrated and thought on hard enough, they are manifested in greater and greater energy. And even us little humans can think to the point that we can cause creations, that we can create matter to actually happen. Because matter is nothing more than the following through of a logical idea. Okay? As long as it's logical and makes sense. So don't go out there creating illogical universes. At the point that it's necessary or logical to create the animal kingdom, then creation does that. It has the idea, then creates the energy uh, forms to create uh, the animal kingdom, which are coarse matter uh, beings. Nature reacts differently than the humans do. After the animal kingdom has <coughs> been evolved and goes to a certain point of stage, there gets to be a point in the stage of development of the creation then where logically it can create human life. And there's quite a bit of difference between the human life and the nature life. Humans evolved naturally out of the dead animal tissue in plants. There's a mixture. Scientifically, that's how it actually works. When the fine matter gets to the point of understanding and knowledge where it can create a human being, that's how it does it. The first human being on a planet where the life uh, uh, acids and so forth are correct around a certain kind of sun where it's possible for human life to, to develop, that's how it is done. The knowledge is provided by the fine matter energy of creation. The coarse matter provides the body material for the first human being to be born. And that is done through an understanding of the mixing together of dead animal tissue and plants. So pl uh, humans are a spirit form that have come out of the idea of creation. We were created then through the logic of the creation, creating this thing we call a universe in logical steps. So there's a part piece of creation in all of us. And that part piece is an understanding of what the creation is. We are connected to it because we are a spirit form which is derived from the spiritual energy which is creation. Humans are totally separate from the flora. Humans are totally separate from the flora and fauna kingdoms. Uh, we have nothing, no connection uh, with the animal kingdom or the food kingdom. You were never a plant. Uh, you were never an animal of any type. You are a separate level of evolution, just as the plant kingdom, the flora kingdom, has its limitations. When the idea for the flora uh, kingdom to be evolved, it has a beginning level of evolution, and it has a high level of evolution. It can only evolve to a certain point. The same with nature. It's a different kind of spiritual energy. It has its level of evolution also. It has a low level of uh, evolution uh, that is necessary to be attained on a planet before the animal kingdom can naturally evolve and become into existence. And it can only uh, evolve so highly. Animals can never evolve to the points that humans can. We are a different kind of spiritual energy because human forms, spirit forms, can evolve in, into what's called perfection, which will be explained a little bit later on. In other words, the human being is capable of evolving to a much higher level than an animal can. An animal has limitations. An animal spirit is different. As we'll discuss a little later, it reincarnates differently on a different time schedule and works differently than the human form does. So be comfortable. You were never a flea, a dog, or a snake, or anything like that. Okay, But it was necessary for our planet to evolve naturally through these levels of evolution before it was possible then for uh, the human being to evolve on his own. So man then begins to develop and evolve. Words are formed into language uh, and develops to the higher forms of perfection. In our galaxy, which we call the Milky Way, originally in our galaxy, it has been learned by the Pleiadians through uh, association with other races, 
that originally in our galaxy when it formed a long time back, there were a little over 44 million different planets where human life, as we know it, evolved naturally on its own. Now, there are countless numbers of sun systems and planets in our Milky Way. But originally, left alone, there was 44 million planets similar to Earth where there was the uh, necessary acids, atmosphere, environmental control, suns, and so forth necessary uh, for a man to evolve. That happened. Of this 44 million, it has grown greatly because the galaxy itself is quite old. Uh, they have now learned that there are 343 variations to the human form that they have discovered. This is variations in fingers, uh, toes, size, bone structure, eyes, uh, nose, so forth. Slight variations in the human form itself, but all nonetheless of the same spiritual type of energy that can strive for perfection and evolve to perfection within creation. At the moment that they know of, there are over 7 billion, 800 million known planets in our galaxy with human life on them. So that original 44 million that evolved on its own has greatly expanded. Of course, that's mostly because the 44 million evolved, became technically advanced, and then went out, moved out into the galaxy, and seeded other planets also. So... Here we are, we're moving along, you and I, in a, uh, on our own little planet, not really aware, factually, of what's going on out in the universe. And now we're finding out that we're kind of on the late freight, that the universe has been going on for a long time, the galaxy is quite old, and before our little civilization came along, there literally have been billions of other civilizations just in our galaxy that are far older than we are. So we have... Uh, we have to look forward to uh, quite a family of man out there to learn, meet, and understand from. Okay, before we go a little farther, a few more explanations on uh, the creation itself and how it actually evolves, in other words, the continued logic of the creation, and then we'll get more into the development of our human life forms. Okay, I mentioned earlier that uh, our universe, uh, and if you looked at the exhibit, is divided into seven different belts or seven different layers of kinds of energy. And then, intricately enough, each one of those different layers of the creation itself are subdivided into different levels of knowledge and understanding also. So the creation actually is a great big, huge thought of knowledge. It's a large idea that once was small and is evolving into a very large area, at least we think of it as large, but on the scale of some other microcosm, it's probably infinitely small. What happens to our creation? Well, let me give you a few more ideas about the creation of ourself, and then we will kind of um, uh, pay a little bit more attention to our own human development. I said originally that once our creation was established, that the outer belt of it, if we could, uh, for instance, take our creation and uh, we suddenly became the incredible enlarged person ourselves, and grew much larger than the universe so we could see the thing, we would look at our creation and see that it is egg-shaped, that it has followed the form of the original idea of creation, which was an egg-formed spiral, and as it has bursted into a large area and, and the Sohar has expanded it, as all of this has happened, it has maintained the general shape. So let's say our creation, as we're looking at it, looks like a big egg. Now let's take a knife and let's slice that egg right in half. And we'll take the top off and just set it aside. And as we look down now at the inside of the creation we're looking at, and again creation now and universe are the same thing at this point, what we see is that it looks like kind of like a tree trunk with different rings in it. And that's these belts that I'm talking about. The outer edge is called a push belt. And that's because it pushes against the other universes. It not only keeps other energies and coarse matter from coming into ours, but it also serves the purpose of keeping our energies from going out and getting involved with other universes. So it's like a separator. It's like a skin on an egg, if you want to call it that. The first layer there is called the creation belt. And this is just a name that is uh, uh, given to it by the Pleiadians as they explained it to Billy. The main purpose, apparently, of the creational belt uh, which is a very highly evolved form of energy, it creates what's called the changing belt, which is the second belt in. Now, the functions of the changing belt, as I understand it, frankly, are to serve <coughs> in the evolution of the material belt, which is next. 
And it is this material belt that you're looking at here, which is where all of the planets are. That is the only belt of the creation that has coarse matter in it. The coarse matter, again, being anything that is solid. There's also a fourth, third, second uh, belt, which are strictly fine matter belts, or creational or spiritual energy, all meaning the same thing. And then, of course, the central Sohar of the universe, sometimes called the central sun, and uh, that is the origin, then, of the creational uh, embodied idea. It has grown into that. So that's what our uh, universe actually looks like when you actually look at it. As a matter of fact, one of the um, scientific secrets uh, for figuring out space travel is right here on this diagram. We live in a material belt where there is time. Only the material belt has the time energy in it. And think of time as an energy. It's a wave of energy that moves impulses through our material belt in this spiral formation. That's, that's why we have rotation, movement, animation of matter in the material belt that does not exist in the other belts. Well, the Pleiadians say one of the first forms of figuring out how to move in time is how to take energy, coarse matter, which can only exist in this, uh, this material belt, move it out of the material belt into the changing belt. In the changing belt, there are no impulses of time. There is no coarse matter. The that's one reason is coarse matter uh, doesn't exist there. So there's a way, apparently, of taking uh, a flying device, moving it out of the material belt, moving it into the changing belt. It's no longer in a solid material form. It's been converted to some other form of matter which can exist in the changing belt, but now it's outside of time. It's no longer... Uh, you know, I'd say in touch with the time pulses so we can move in time. And once the knowledge is understood of how the pulses of time work, you can go into the changing belt, move your flying device, whatever you, however your programming is, then re-enter the material belt at some other place and kind of jump back onto the time wave impulse as it's moving through this spiral shape through creation, and you're in a different time. So that's one way of actually doing it. Okay, a little more things about our, uh, a little more information about our own creation here. As our creation continues to evolve, there will be no more material belts. It is only this one, because the creation, this is how it evolves. Now, interestingly enough, I talked earlier about that there are seven levels. There's a little bit more to this. As the creation itself continues to evolve, it is now expanding and sending energies all out, all through itself, which is called the universe it will go through stages of development. And those development stages are the process of evolving fine matter into coarse matter, which facilitates the evolution of the creation itself. You see, as creation gets an idea for a plant, an animal, or a human, that plant, animal, or human then, in its coarse matter state, in its material form, itself gathers information learning and wisdom, and it is that learning, experience, and wisdom which contributes to the evolution, then, of the creation. Because just like the creation, and being a small part of the creation, it then is thinking. And what's thinking? Thinking is the creation of an idea, isn't it? And what's an idea? An idea is the formation of logic. What is matter? If you take logic and concentrate it, at a certain point it becomes matter. Okay, so all of us as physical beings, the animals, the plants, everything that is existing because of the idea that the fine matter world had to create it, is now evolving on and contributing more ideas, more energy to the, the spiritual fuel, you might want to call it, or evolution of the creation itself. So we're all little small parts of the creation. Everything is. A tree, a squirrel, an animal, a planet, a moon, a, everything is. They are all part of the natural, intelligent, logic evolution of the creation itself. Hence, you can start to see what responsibility that we have as little minute creatures and spirit forms of the creation, why we have to start taking the entire creation itself into considerations of respect. Not something that we're doing well on this planet at this point. Up to now, we've been looking at the planet as something that we can just plunder and do whatever we want with. 
We dig holes in it and drag the oil and gas out of it. We dig holes in it. We blow it up. We do whatever we want because we just look at it as a dumb old piece of dirt or something that we're living on. We have no respect for it, and we, we have no respect for it because we have no understanding of why it's important. We don't know at this point what the creation is doing. So hopefully, knowledge that the Pleiadians are providing us with through Billy uh, will get out into the world and people will become more and more aware <clears throat> of the respect that we need to have for creation and we can move towards a better understanding of how to live in harmony with it. Well, anyway, our creation is going to continue evolving. It will go through all these levels of growth, of, of different levels of evolution, of creating suns and planets and flora and fauna and people. All of these things continue to evolve, providing the evolution of the creation. At a certain point, the creation itself, or the universe as we're calling it also, will pull back into itself. Now, this is pretty fascinating. You see, so far, the universe has been out there just growing. Okay? And it's been doing that, actually, for uh, 47 trillion years. That's right. The creation that we are living in is 47 trillion years since that original embodied idea decided to create this universe that we are in, this creation that we are living in. Now, we have no way of tracking that because the material or coarse matter <coughs> excuse me, part of the universe is not nearly that old, that old. So, since our science at the moment can only track something in material form, we have no idea how old that the creation really is. When, in fact, our creation will go through a total lifespan of 311 trillion 40 billion years. That will be the entire lifespan of the creation that we are in. This creation uh, has gone through so far 47 trillion years of that, which is about one sixth of the way through its cycle. In your exhibits, there's also a little drawing there showing that there are seven levels of development to a creation. A creation will go through this 311 trillion year cycle of expansion, evolution, and then it contracts and pulls back into itself. <clears throat> At that point, the creation then goes into kind of a sleep stage, you might call it. It's now cogitating all the things that it has learned. It's in a sleep state. And then again, it will repeat the same cycle that it did. It will now have more knowledge than it did before because it's more evolved. It has now benefited from the experience and wisdom of all of its spirit form parts, which is all of the flora, fauna, and human kingdom throughout the entire creation. Since, since its exception for trillions of years, it has benefited from all of that knowledge. And now it's going to do it again. And it will go through again, creates another uh, universe, it will go through uh, more advanced stages of development. It will again create planets, suns, flora, fauna, and the human uh, kingdom. And it will evolve all the way through a cycle again. And once again, it will pull back together into a sleep stage. The universe that we live in is called the creational universe because it creates human life. It creates beings like ourselves that do evolve, and that's its mechanism of evolution. Its mechanism, its method by which it evolved is to create <clears throat> small life forms, bit parts of itself that go out and do, experience, think, form logic, and contribute to it the whole of its evolution. So it's called a creational universe. It will go through seven cycles of creating itself in universe form and sleeping in between. So it's life and death, more or less. It's off and it's on. There's a creation. There's an expansion, there's a contraction, there's a sleep period. Okay? It does this seven times, and then it changes, kind of a metamorphosis, into another kind of universe. After it has done this seven times, this mechanics of creating material belts and creating uh, different kinds of life forms which contribute to its evolution, that mechanics will be done seven times, and then it's turned into... It, you might say it itself evolves into a different kind of universe called an Ur universe. U R. Okay? And then an Ur universe also will go through seven cycles of growth, but it's different. It doesn't go through the material through all the time, but they have a specific function. Ur universes create other creational universes. 
They're kind of like the mother universes. Okay, and this is where the process, logic, and understanding of birth comes from. Within the creation, it knows how to create other coarse matter beings. So our creational universes know this, evolve into an Ur universe. Ur universes go through seven stages of developing other creational universes. Okay, and then after an Ur universe goes through its seven levels of its own evolution of learning and understanding how to create entirely new universes to start off, new creational ideas, it then evolves into what's called a central universe. Very little is known about a central universe. And the Pleiadians have only figured out these three stages. It's quite possible there may be other stages of development also of the universes, but none is known yet. It's quite possible there will probably be seven levels altogether because the universe, the creation so far, seems to revolve totally around sevens all the way through. It evolves in seven levels. It itself goes through seven stages of development. Each level of coarse matter life that is within the creation, whether it's animal, plant, or human, goes through seven stages of development, which we're going to spend a little more time on in a minute talking about the seven stages of development of the human life. So universes, or excuse me, or creations, go through basically three stages of evolution that the Pleiadians know about so far. The simple universes, like we are in, uh, of creating material belts, then Ur, Ur universes, and that, that also evolve into creational universes, I mean central universes. Okay, I see by the old tape machine here that we're running out of tape, so um, I'll see you on the other side. Okay, welcome to side two here on uh, tape one about the creation. I was just explaining uh, how the creations work, that they do go through seven states, stages of development. They do evolve then into a different kind of universe called an Ur universe, which creates other creational types like we're in. That then goes through seven stages of development and evolves into a central universe. Now, we are in the creational universe that we are in. Uh, we'll go through seven stages of development. We are in the first stage of that development, and we're in the 47th trillion year of that. So our creation has a few years to go, uh, over 250 trillion here to go, it looks like, and then it will collapse back into itself. So that's quite a bit of time. We don't have anything really to worry about there. We're in the very first stage of these seven stages of development. So our universe, our creation, same thing, has quite a bit of ways to go before it uh, finishes its own personal cycle of growth here and grows into being a universe. Okay, let's move into an area that's a little bit more personal now for you and I. Let's discuss about how the evolution of the human being form actually comes about and what it's doing within the creation. We've learned now that the creation itself is going to go through seven stages of development that originally it was an idea that created what we call this universe. So it has brought with it the knowledge from wherever before the previous universe that created this one. Some Ur universe someplace created ours. So it had already evolved through all the things that we've done. The point is that creations themselves can't just go out and instantly make a universe. It just doesn't happen instantly. It evolves very, very slowly through wisdom and intelligence every step of the way learning how to create all of the infinite small particles of itself. It's taking it trillions of years to get to this point right now where we're at. We took it that long to figure out how to take the fluffy matter and create it into gas, to create the gas into suns and planets, to create the food kingdom and the animal kingdom and us. Every stage along the way it had to earn that through experience. Now, I'm sure included in all that experience, uh, there has been a lot of mistakes made, a lot of trial and error that the creation itself has to go through. It has to figure out how to do everything. The knowledge, creation's knowledge, is stored within itself in what's called this fine matter world. Sometimes people call the fine matter world uh, spiritual energy or creational energy. That's fine. We're talking about the same thing here. <clears throat> the Pleiadians use the term fine matter to describe any kind of etheric or energy form. 
and coarse matter once again to describe anything that's solid that's been created out of the knowledge of some fine matter someplace. Okay, so actually everything that exists in the creation is a combination of coarse matter and fine matter. That there is fine matter somehow involved in its atomic structure uh, that helped create the material matter and is part of the mapping or the knowledge that makes it exist. So matter for the most part then <clears throat> is just ideas that are manifested into solid form. Okay, so now let's see how the human being comes along here. We're in a universe where trillions of years have gone by. The creation itself has figured out how to evolve, how to establish itself within this great absolutum. And it's figured out how to develop and evolve through these different stages. And it gets to the point now where it's going to create the first human being on the first planet someplace. That happens. I'm sure a certain amount of experimentation went into that. This first guy must have been quite a sight. If he was created out of dead animal tissue and plants, I can just imagine what this guy looked like. But the point is that this guy didn't know very much. The fine matter energy that figured out how to create him probably didn't know any more than except how to actually create a body and build a brain and put some information in it. At this point, his intelligence is very low because he has no experiences. And experiences in life, experiences in the physical form is how we gather information. Now, well, the reason for the material life is to gather information with your physical senses, experience, create logic and thoughts, create conclusions, and as you experience things, you contribute wisdom to your spirit, to this fine matter energy which created you originally. See, we aren't material beings having one life. That's just our personality. That's just our persona, we think of it. That's our conscious mind in the material state. Uh, that's you know who we think we are. We're, we're Randolph, we're, we're Nancy, we're Bob, we're Larry, whoever we are. That's a passing phenomenon. We are really spiritual beings, fine matter energy forms, that go through a series of material lives on purpose in order to experience and to gather information. Because it's the spirit then that moves on. It never dies. It never sleeps. It is a continuous form of energy and creation which is striving for perfection. Striving for perfection means that in itself, it needs to gather all the information it can so it can also get back at one with the creation itself. It's a part piece of creation now because it was created out of creation and is still connected to it somewhat. But it needs to strive for per perfection and rejoin with creation itself. We are the highest form of life form in the creation. Plants and animals, uh, planets themselves, fluffy matter, gas, and other things can only evolve up to a certain point. So there are stages of energies in the creation. We are the highest stage of level of energy in the creation itself. And that's why we say we strive for perfection, because unlike all the other stages before us, they can only reach a certain level and that's it. We are the final stage that evolves into being again with the creation itself, which is what I'm going to go through now and explain all about our levels of development and how we get there and it'll start making more sense to you. So we have our first guy who's come along here, been created out of dead animal tissue and plants. He's a really good looking guy. Uh, he has practically no knowledge at all. And unlike the animal kingdom, which has instinct, where it is born into it with certain knowledges, that its spirit has certain knowledges that it puts into it for survival, the human being doesn't. He's at the very low level of his development now. He really just has no wisdom to fall back on at all. You see, as we go through material lives, the wisdom that we gain from experiences is stored in the fine matter world in our spirit. And that is carried forward so we have access to it in the following life. So as we go through numerous multiple uh, material lives, we start gaining wisdom from all of our experiences. And as we gain that wisdom, the spirit remembers it. And in your next material life, you have access or you might say the usage of that. That's what determines your intelligence and your ability and your aptitudes as you move forward and begins to explain why we're all slightly different. You see we're all on different paths, different uh, understanding, and different things we're learning about. Okay, if we were on a Pleiadian world and we're attending class there and wanted to learn about these seven developmental stages of human life forms, 
then that's what I'm going to go over right now. Billy Meyer was given a, you might say, a listing or a uh, kind of a printout of uh, the seven different levels of human life within creation. Since creation itself has created its own uh, laws, you might say, or logic by virtue of its development, its evolution, it has figured out how to create a universe, how to create the fluffy matter, the gaseous material, and so forth. So it has earned the right or learned all the way along on, on the different stages of development of different kinds of life. And the human life form is no different than anything else. It also must conform to the logic of creation. And so there is a logical, you might say, progression of development of the human life form as it goes through its evolutionary processes. So there are really kind of like laws of logic or rules, you might say, because there is a fixed order of logic on how we develop. When we come into our first lifetime, we have no previous knowledge. Uh, we haven't lived at all yet. We have no experiences, so we have no accumulated knowledge. So we really don't know much of anything. And I imagine our first guy that came along probably didn't live very long. He probably was just, you know, snuffed out by an animal right away or whatever. Probably didn't live too long. Short lifespan, no knowledge how to take care of himself. Uh, so I'm going to go through this uh, prepared list, which was made for Billy, which explains the different levels of development. It explains all seven levels, seven steps of development of the human life, and breaks it down a little bit in uh, seven different steps. So there are seven levels to, levels to the development of the human life form. Five of those levels are in physical form. Two of those levels are in non-physical forms. And then we return and become part of creation. So I'm going to explain the different seven levels. By the way, each one of these seven levels is broken down into seven sub-levels, and then seven below that, seven below that. So it's seven across and then seven sub-levels down. But we won't have time and we won't break it down that far here. I'm just going to talk about the main uh, seven breakdowns or levels of the development of human life. In the first level, it's called primary life. Obviously so, because it's the very beginnings. So your first material life uh, would be called the primary development of the intellect and the spirit. So that's the first thing that has to happen. There is no development at that point in your first lifetime. You have no knowledge uh, from any previous lifetimes. It's the first one. So it's the primary development or the very beginning of development of your intellect using your brain, using your logical patterns. I suppose at this point the first person is just trying to figure out how to um, walk, uh, to get around, to find food. Uh, maybe some sort of shelters, whatever. So the process is that we go through a material life. While we were going through the material life, we gather information and experiences with our senses, sight, feel, touch, smell, and so forth. We make logical decisions. When we make logical decisions, that they become part of our life. When we decide on something and that becomes part of us, we gain wisdom from that. And that information, that cognition, that understanding of a basic thing that becomes part of us, then that wisdom from that goes into our spirit. Not, the, uh, not every logical conclusion that you come to goes into your spirit, because the spirit itself, remember, is a, a bit piece, a part piece of creation. It is connected to creation, whether you're aware of it or not, and it has the ability to, um, you might say, check out your conclusions and compare it against the logic of creation to see if it's correct. If it's incorrect, if it's illogical, if it's harmful to the spirit, it does not accept it. It actually refuses it. On the, after we go through these seven levels of human development, uh, and later on in the tape, I'm going to go over the actual mechanics in the mind and in the spirit, how it retains thoughts and how that works, and we'll discuss that a little bit more. But right now, let me go through these seven different steps of development of the human life and explain what these steps are. The second step uh, would be the primary thinking of intellect and spirit. So to begin with, first of all, in your first stages, you have to learn how to think basically at all, to use your brain into the very basic functions. Uh, that may take several lifetimes. You might not live very long. For, uh, at this stage, <laughs> you don't have enough uh, intelligence probably to even uh, protect yourself very well. So your first few lifetimes are probably rather brief. As a matter of fact, the reason or reason. Okay, first we're developing some intelligence, uh, then we're going to like start thinking, and now we're reasoning things out, we're figuring things out, like 
okay, I better not get too close to that large animal because he will kill me. Okay. Fourth step under primary life is the primary exercise of intellect and spiritual force. Okay. Uh, the fifth step is primary reasonable actions. So here you're figuring out, you're, be, you're, you're developing reasoning. Now it may have taken a couple thousand lifetimes to even get to this point where you're actually beginning to use reasoning and thinking and so forth to understand how to take care of your life. Each one of these lifetimes you go through, we contribute very little in the form of spiritual growth. Spiritual growth is the actual wisdom retained by the spirit as a result of experiences in the material life. You'll go completely through a material life. It's possible to go clear through it and practically learn nothing. Many people live kind of in spiritual stagnation, completely unaware of uh, their spirit at all, and leading the kind of life that contributes nothing. So it may take them hundreds of lifetimes to progress hardly anything at all. The idea behind this list is that all of these levels, types of things, must be gone through. That the human being can't skip anything. Uh, each human being who goes through his own cycles of life, we may start off the same with, uh, you know, it's kind of like a hard drive on a computer with nothing on it, then we start adding software. Well, our spirit is much like that. As we go through each lifetime, it gathers a little bit of wisdom, but everybody lives their lifetime differently. So we're all out gathering wisdom, experiencing things, and contributing wisdom to our spirit about different information at different times. So each person coming into life has different objectives, has different things, different paths that he is on of learning. So even though we start off the same, within a very few short lifetimes, we're all working on different things, but we don't get to bypass anything. The idea is that there are X amount of things that have to be learned about life and contribute, and we're all going to go through them at one time or another, just not at the same time. Okay, the seven breakdowns of primary life then. One was primary development of the intellect. Two was primary thinking of the intellect. Three is primary thinking and reasoning. Four is the primary exercise of intellectual and spiritual force. Five was the primary reasonable actions. Six is the primary will uh, caused, it says, will cause thinking. So we have an individual here now is starting to use his own will. Seventh is the reason conditioned leading of the life. We have an individual here now who's... Um, uh, uh, least able to control himself and take care of his life. He can think, he can reason, and he can take care of himself. So this is still a very underdeveloped person. Creatures at this level of development are you know, usually thought of as being insane or idiots. Uh, their spirits and intellects are really just you know, not very developed at all, uh, which they have to learn an awful lot to get going. And again, we only add very little to each lifetime as far as spiritual growth as we go through. So just to get through the primary life may take several million years. The second step of development in the human life is called the reasoned life. And that's broken down into seven levels also. Each one of those seven is also broken into seven, which we won't go into. But reasoned life is the second level of development of human life. And this refers to those cycles of life those lifetimes you're going to lead where your reasoning really figures in the development or evolution of your spiritual self. The first level in reason life is called primary development of reason. This is the very beginning of scratching our head and going, hmm, how about that? To figure these things out. Let's think things through, okay? The second level is the effective realization of reason and her use. Well, we're getting results. We're going through a lifetime now, we're trying to figure things out, and we're starting to recognize a little bit the cause and effect of things. That, gee, what about this? Or if that, and if I think this way, this happens. So we have an individual here reasoning, trying to figure out how to cope with his life by virtue of reasoning. The third level of reasoned life is the primary acknowledgement and cognition of higher influences. So at this level, it's probably the first time our guy here is coming to the realization that, hmm, there may be a more intelligent, higher life forms out there somewhere. There could actually be something more intelligent out there. Maybe something really did create life. Okay. The fourth level is the belief of higher influences without owning any knowledge about it. 
Now, this would be at the development stages where people are developing belief, st uh, belief concepts. They're believing maybe in a sun god or a rain god or a river god or whatever, uh, a god, a leader. They start looking for answers to themselves. They're starting to try to define the meaning of life or creating belief concepts. But they really don't know what they're talking about is the general idea because they don't have the knowledge, the wherewithal, or the spiritual growth to look within to really learn. See, the interesting part is that at all, see, the interesting part is that at all times of development throughout all of this, there is a spirit in there that is connected to creation, but the material self does not have the conscious knowledge or ability to be able to use the spirit to actually get in touch with creation for the understanding. It takes a while, many, many lifetimes, before the individual actually learns to understand the fact that, yee, I do have a spirit, and I can use this spiritual self to actually learn more about creation and about life. And Well, what do you know? I can use my spirit actually to help my material life. That will set in eventually, but not at this point. Okay, the fifth step of reasoned life is the belief of higher forces, superstition, fear of evil, veneration of good, etc., it's time for, this is a germination time, it says, for religions and et cetera to, to come into power. You know, we're starting to form beliefs. We think this might be the way it works. And we form religions. But we really don't know the answer yet. The sixth level of reasoned life is the primary recognition of real reality. Research, position of, the, of real truths. First, spiritual cognitions and their use spiritual curing, telepathy, etc. Now this is considered by the Pleiadians to be the present position of the average earth human being. So let's go over that again, the average earth human being. By the way, we're also told at this point that the average earth human being is 60 to 80 million years old as a spirit form. Okay, So if you take 60 million years and divide that maybe by an average lifespan of uh, 30, 40 years, you can see that by this time we've had an awful lot of material lives just to get up to this point. Okay, again, that level was the primary recognition of reality, research of real knowledge, first spiritual cognitions. That means we're just at the point, many of us are just at the point where we're beginning to understand and are quite sure we really do have a spiritual self, that we're more than just a material being, that there's more to us. Our first spiritual curings and so forth. Here they're talking about that we're understanding that if we have a spirit, well, possibly it's useful. Maybe there's something we can do with this spiritual self that we can develop some sort of force with the spirit where it could be useful for better health. Perhaps it's useful for communicating. Well, maybe it's even useful to try to get information from other life forms. Maybe it's useful to try to get in touch with creation or God or whatever we think of as God. Maybe that's entirely possible. Now, this is exactly about where the average Earth human being is. As a matter of fact, most of them, are, I'm, I'm afraid a lot of them aren't quite to this level. But this is where the Pleiadians see the average Earth human being at this point. The seventh level of development of reasoned life is called the primary development of knowledge and wisdom. So this would be an area here where development of knowledge and wisdom, where we are actually looking for real facts. We're trying to find out what wisdom really is. The third step of development of human life is called the intellect life. Okay? Now our first was primary life. The second is reasoned life, where we learn to think. The third is intellectual life. We're starting to intellectualize things. We're actually coming to conclusions, forming logic. Okay, intellect's life. It's broken also into seven levels. The first level is called the high development of the intellect, high technology, second utilization of spiritual forces, and primary creation of living forms. Okay, well now we have some intelligence in our being here, besides just having reasoning faculties. We're using our intellect here. We're developing high intelligence, which we are. Many of our people these days, scientists are, and a lot of young children are coming along with great intelligence. It's surprising how bright some of these kids are that are born these days. So high technology. Yes, we do have high technology. We're learning more and more about the atom molecules, the secrets of nature. We're developing now systems which will enable us technically to leave our solar system and explore the universe. So we are certainly moving into times of high technology. Second utilization of spiritual forces. 
I would say you could probably define that, that in the New Age community. The people are searching for. They are trying out. They are trying to discover what can be done with spiritual forces. We're aware now that things like telepathy and so forth are possible. That the spiritual self somehow does uh, have an effect on the material life. That a person who understands more and more about the spirit itself is somehow better connected to the life force of the universe. We're becoming aware of that. And we're also becoming aware that because you are more of a spiritual person, that somehow life just seems to get a little better. These people seem to be a little luckier. They seem to be healthier. They seem to live a little longer. We're finding these things out. The second level of intellectual life is the realization and exercise of knowledge. Exercise of knowledge, okay. Truth and wisdom. And also, slow breakup of acceptances of belief. Belief is when you believe something might be true, but you don't have the facts. Now, that's uh, very common. But more and more, we're learning more facts about things. So our belief systems, our old mythical belief systems, are breaking down. And we see that already in 1992. Less people are turning to belief structures of all types to answer today's problems. We are evolving more and more into a more sophisticated world where old belief systems do not provide the answers to today's problems. This present position right here, they say, is the present position of the educated earth human beings, scientists, etc., leading edge thinkers, and so forth. Probably most of you listening to this tape would fall into that category. You are seekers of truth and wisdom. And you're listening to this tape, hoping that you might find some little pearl of information or knowledge that uh, you might need just at this moment to move yourself on down your own path of evolution. And that's exactly why you're listening to the tape. Because uh, not only do we have to feed our material body, and we have to feed ourselves at lunch, we have to feed our spirit with knowledge also. And most of you listening to this tape are probably feeling the need to feed your spiritual knowledge. You're looking for answers to things, just like I have looked the past few years. And I find it very interesting to share it because it's not only part of my own growth, but I'm quite sure that the things that we're talking about here are the beginning, definitely, of breakup of belief structures and the beginning of wisdom and truth. We're moving that direction. The third level of the intellectual life is the first utilization of knowledge and wisdom. Okay. Well, we're seeing more and more people who have not only discovered that the spirit can be powerful and wisdom is powerful, but we're finding people who are actually beginning to use it more and more in the form of psychics, uh, people looking into astrology, numerology. We find this a lot in the New Age, so-called New Age metaphysical community, where they may not be right about everything, but they're certainly trying. And that's what growth is all about. You know, it's fine to make mistakes. Uh, that's just a natural part of the learning process. So we are at the beginning stages of this, where our people who are experimenting with spiritual growth don't know all the answers yet, but let's give them a hand for certainly trying, and let's see how they do, maybe pay attention to what they're learning and see if it's useful for ourselves. Because remember, everybody goes through all these different paths of learning. Uh, myself and... Uh, I found that certain things I'm interested in, certain things I'm not. And so, you know, I, I look at some information and it's just not right for me at the time. I'm not interested in it. And other things get me very excited and I follow that. So information is out there for all of us to use when we need it, when it's good for us. The fourth level of intellectual life is called the acknowledgement and utilization of nature's laws, generation of hypertechnology, the second creation of living forms. Well, acknowledgement and utilization of nature's laws. Nature's laws. Hmm, how many people have actually stopped and even thought about laws of nature? Well, we know there is a nature out there, and scientifically we're starting to understand a little bit more. But perhaps there really was some logic that creation had in mind when it created nature. Maybe nature really does live by some set of logical rules and understanding. Wouldn't that be amazing to find out? then maybe there really is something we could learn. Well, there definitely is. Uh, there's nothing illogical in creation. It had to learn, figure out, and think nature. So at this level, at that fourth level of intellectual's life, when people get to that level, that's what they can expect to be working on in that area, understanding of how nature really works. For instance, some of nature's laws like gravity, for instance, 
Some of nature's laws, like gravity, can be broken. The mind can actually levitate objects. Now, Billy has learned these things and on some occasions has used his spiritual force and his knowledge of nature to actually do things like levitation. And he's been known to do that. There are even pictures of him levitating an oven onto a truck when they were moving at some point. And he's demonstrated and explained much of this information to the people around him by doing the simple basic things like bending spoons, heating up coins and other things, as well as telepathy is a form of nature's laws, understanding how that works. But understanding nature mostly is understanding how the planets and all of nature operate, their cycles and how we live with it. Imagine if you had the ability to cause a tree to fully grow, say within a year, instead of taking 50 years. Now that would be manipulating nature's laws, wouldn't it? But if you were at the point of development, where you understood exactly what it was in nature that caused a tree to grow, why it grew at a certain rate, and why it would take 50 years, there would be a point where you would have the knowledge and understanding perhaps to inter, uh, interface with that and speed it up. You would then be interfering and manipulating or utilizing the laws of nature. Well, generation of hyper-technology. Of course, that would be the area where we just plain understand more and more about the universe, and that's going to come naturally. Uh, definitely as we move off the planet. The fifth level of the intellectual life is called the natural exercise of wisdom and knowledge and cognition of spiritual forces. Now cognition refers to absolute knowledge when you have knowledge of something. Excuse me, not the belief. So at this level we're talking about where we are beginning to learn so much about the spirit that we have cognition, that we have actual knowledge of exactly how spiritual forces work and people will begin using them in a factual way with predictable results. The sixth level of intellectual life is life which uh, life in knowing about wisdom, it says, truth and logic. Well, there isn't, our world isn't run much on wisdom, and most of us don't, uh, you know, run our lives uh, uh, based on wisdom, truth, and logic. But some people do, a small percentage of our society actually does, that they base their life and the control of their life and their growth on logic, truth, and wisdom. There is a time when that becomes more and more important to people, and the material things seem to slowly drift away, where we're less concerned with material pleasures, and we start living our life using wisdom, and the things that we do are based on truth instead of, you know, illogical things. Okay? The seventh level of intellectual life is the primary cognition of reality as an absolute. Now, that's an interesting statement. Primary cognition of the reality as an absolute. That means that there really are truths, that there is definite laws to the universe, and we not only have heard about it, but we've tried it out, and we found out it's true. We're discovering the basic matrix of creation itself, and we get to the point where we actually understand it, start to understand nature's laws, and we start to actually live that way. The Pleiadians say this is the present position of just a very few border and spiritual scientists. Very small percentage of our population. That's the first three levels or steps of development of human life. And obviously these are all still very material lives. Again, the reason for the material life is the senses. The types of information uh, that the spirit needs to grow then is very basic stuff. Primary reasoning, thinking, and working out the intellect. All of this is done through experiencing things with the senses, and then from those experiences, those things which are correct according to creation are added to your spirit and carried forward from lifetime to lifetime. And you make use of them once you find out you actually have a spirit, and you make some use of it. If you don't know you have a spirit and don't make any use of it, like uh, many religions will teach, where you actually think that the whole purpose of life then is just to worship a god of some type, then you're not going to make progress very fast. You're going to actually be living spiritually stagnant lives because there will be practically no progress whatsoever. Because, in truth, the only way to spiritually grow is to understand that you are responsible. You are 100% responsible for your own growth, your own evolution within creation. Okay, the fourth level or the fourth step of development of human life is called the real life. 
Okay, fourth step, real life. First level is the clear knowledge about reality as an absolute. Now, we mentioned the, in the uh, last step, an intellectual's life here, that, that we're beginning to understand that there were real absolute laws or logic to creation. So in real life, we're going to go through several lifetimes where that becomes very clear, where we really develop a clear understanding that there really is absolute logic to the creation. The second level of real life is the cognition of spiritual knowledge and spiritual wisdom. In other words, we really then have got it locked in. Cognition means that we have the truth about, okay, the facts. That means that we would have the real truth about spiritual knowledge. We not only would know that we have a spirit, we would be past the period where we're experimenting with it, and we would have actual knowledge of how it works. We would be using then the true wisdom of our spirit that's within our spirit to govern our lives. We would be using our spirit then actually to reach out into creation and pull knowledge back for us. It would become a definite part then of how we live. We would be, in effect, becoming more and more of a spiritual being and less and less of a material being. Our senses then would start playing a less prominent role in our life. Right now, whenever we approach some situation in life, we use our eyes, our ears, touch, sense, smell, and so forth to quickly make a decision on how to react. We're very material beings, most people on this planet. Most everything is observed as a material being, and decisions are made basically on material uh, senses. Well, over a period of time, we become more sophisticated, and that's what this is saying. We become more sophisticated, we have more knowledge of spirit, and pretty soon we start finding out that the spirit is actually very powerful, and that we can perceive the world using our spiritual abilities, because our spirit now is, is in fact very intelligent and has connections to higher intelligence. Plus, in order to evolve now, it is necessary to get information that provides experiences at a higher level. The spirit's no longer interested in how to make fire, and it's no longer interested in petty rivalry and fighting and arguing and silly belief structures and so forth. It has lived through those periods. And in order for the spirit to grow now, it needs more sophisticated knowledge, knowledge that the material senses don't necessarily provide. They still go out and get information for us, but the conclusions that are derived from that information are done more and more with the spirit itself. The spiritual self is making more conclusions. So we're becoming more of a spiritual person and less of a material person. Okay? The third level of real life is the utilization of the spiritual knowledge and spiritual wisdom. Well, this is just an extension of what we were talking about. That now the individual is using his spiritual knowledge, so his abilities of telepathy, the force of his spirit is increasing his lifespan. The force of his spirit now is controlling his health. Might even be controlling more of what you look like, where even through your own spiritual force you could control how your hair is growing. Uh, you wouldn't need to sleep as much. The wisdom within your spirit would be so powerful that you wouldn't even ever consider lying or doing things that are illogical. You're becoming a person who does things so much for the right reasons that you're always lucky. Things just naturally go your way all of the time. Okay, the fourth level of real life is called cognition of the reality of creation and her laws. Now, all along, here for many lifetimes, we're starting to understand that there is a creation. We're slowly becoming aware that there's some logic to the creation itself. It's not illogical. We know all about our spirit now, and now we have cognition. Our spirit has developed so much that it is tuning in more and more to creation, higher influences, higher life forms, higher sources of information, and we have factual proof, factual knowledge of actually how creation works. We'll be remember earlier in our remember earlier in our tapes when Billy was allowed to spend seven minutes in creation or eternity as we called it and that during that time he was allowed to remember that. So he was exposed for seven minutes to the creational life force and then was able to remember it afterwards and what a, what a change in his life that was for him. Well, not only he got to experience it then, but now we're talking about a level of life where you would constantly be aware because of the force of your spirit what's going on in creation, 
And most everything you do in life now is through the utilization and the, and the awareness of creation itself, creation's logic, and if you want to call it that, creation's laws. I don't particularly like the word laws. It sounds like something man-made, like it's fixed in stone, and I guess that's why they use the word law, but I prefer to use the concept of logic, the logic of creation. Okay, the fifth level of real life is the living from the creational laws, or logic, purification of the spirit and the intellect, cognition of the true obligation and force of the spirit, complete breakdown and acceptance of beliefs. Well, this is a pretty major step here. We now have a being who's still physical, but they're living mostly from the creational logic totally where they are so aware now of the logic of creation and all of its knowledge is of nature. They are so knowledgeable at the spiritual forces that they're living their life based on all of this knowledge. They're becoming much less a material being and having far less use for the material senses. Okay? It also says they have cognition of the true obligation and force of the spirit. So now we have total understanding of what the spirit is for, at this point, there would probably be almost total awareness of previous lives. You would be well aware then all the time of your connection of spirit within creation, and you would feel the force of the perfection of creation all of the time. Also, it's this complete breakdown of belief structures. Well, obviously, at this point, once you have all the facts about creation, nature, and your spiritual self, um, you're no longer caught up in belief structures because you know the truth about things. So at this point, there are no more belief structures. This is the present level of pretty much the people on the Pleiadian worlds. At this point, they have uh, understanding of the nature's laws, of the spiritual laws, and they have great understanding of the logic of creation, and this is their level of understanding. This is why their morality, their spiritual development, and so forth, is so much different than ours that they, frankly, have no interest at this point in having any sort of social commerce with us, which is quite understandable. Our thinking is much different. Many people are always concerned about the Pleiadian context of Billy and Meyer, why they did this or why they didn't do that, and uh, why they would react some way, or why don't they get more involved here, or why didn't they uh, do something. Well, herein lies your answer to most of those questions. They're living at a total different level of understanding and development within creation. Their viewpoints of the world are entirely different. The way they respond to things is much different. They're obviously going to be far less emotional and prone to uh, you know, anger and flying off the handle and things because they have so much knowledge about things. You know, in the... When, when you see people who get violently jealous or angry and hatred and so forth like that, these are very undeveloped beings who are responding to stimuli in the world at exaggerated levels because they are strictly material beings. The spirit doesn't respond like that. The more and more you become a spiritual being and live within spiritual logic and creational logic, there is less reason for that. You will just be able to be a calmer person and deal with things in a much more balanced uh, way. Okay, the fifth level or step, uh, step of development in human life is called creational life. Up to now, we've also been dealing, though, strictly with physical life forms, and at this point, we are still a physical life form following the basic logic of creation where we have a physical life, a sleep period, a physical life, a sleep period. Even during our uh, physical lives, we're awake and we go to sleep. So the, the logic set up by creation from the very beginning of the off and on, of the awake and the sleep, uh, permeates throughout all of our uh, life forms as well as our own, and permeates human life. It is still necessary for us to have the death cycle on purpose so that the spirit can cogitate, so that the spirit can sleep. So that is the primary thing that we have to have. It's still necessary for us to sleep even at night, to rest the, you know, the physical being and so forth, even though that the spirit doesn't sleep. It never goes to sleep. It's always open for business. It's always listening. Even though your subconscious is rattling around in there when you're dreaming heavy at night and working out the problems of the day, it never sleeps. Okay. Well, we're at the fifth step of development, creational life, and we're still having physical lifetimes. At this point, though, they will be much longer because the force of spirit creates a longer life, a healthier life, 
it is a natural kind of perk, you might say, of uh, creation that the uh, longer you live, the longer your lifespans go. And that's because of force of spirit. When you're very young, your spirit has very little, if no force, uh, has no wisdom, and cannot sustain the material life very long. One, because of low intelligence for survival, plus it has a very low life force, so it really can't even sustain the life, the physical life, very long. But as you get older and live more uh, lifetimes, the spirit becomes much stronger, and at this point in creational life, uh, where we have seen that we have lived through periods and millions of years of existence. Uh, we've accumulated much knowledge and wisdom about nature and spirit and creation. So at this point, we not only live longer, we live healthier, we live happier, we live luckier. Okay, the first level of creational life is creating and control of living forms. Well, at this point, they're suggesting that there's a time when we have so much knowledge of creation and spirit forms that we can actually begin to create our own life forms. And I shouldn't use the word create, we manipulate more or less uh, fine matter energies into making life forms. At this point, for instance, an example would be that you would be able to develop, say, an organic android. You could, by knowledge and your understanding of nature, spirit, and creational logic, create a life force, an android that actually could live and think, walk and talk and so forth. Now it may not have a spirit like we do, but the Pleiadians do have these. They have armies of these things we would call like droids that do their manufacturing and other work. It would also be possible at this point that you could probably procreate a spirit. Procreate means cause it to be born. That's what happened to Billy. He was caused to be born along with three other individuals 1937, at an exact time in the morning, on purpose, by Pleiadian beings who were developed enough and understood well enough how to use the force of their spirit and their knowledge to cause Billy's spirit to come into material life at that time. So that's what it's suggesting here, control of living forms. The second level of creational life is the construction of machine apparatus, livable creatures. Well, again, here we're talking about making different types of androids, I guess we would call them, uh, living life forms that you, because of the knowledge that you have. The third level of creational life is spiritual development of forces for control of material and organical forms of life. All right. Well, your spiritual force here then is probably very much in control of nature. You could probably cause flowers to be born by the force of your spirit. You might even be able to cause them to mutate or transmit into other forms. You would have those knowledges. The fourth level of creational life, it says, will condition mastering of life and all of its forms and spirits. So here you're definitely becoming a master of the life where almost total knowledge then of the uh, primary thinking, of the intellectual, of the spirit, of nature and creation is within your grasp. You have almost total knowledge then after millions of years of lifetimes of, these, of the entire life cycle up to this point. Now that makes you very, very knowledgeable, but again, of course, now we're into billions of years of lifetimes. Okay, I see we're running out of tape once again. Going to have to get longer tapes. So uh, just fast forward this one. They're just a little bit on it. And I'll see you on the uh, next side. This should be side one of uh, creation tape number two.